And a lot of those Christians did not have the Holy Ghost. They just lived all that they knew. And uh, they died a martyr's death. But some of them did. And 50 million of them were martyred by uh, the Catholic Church. Of those that would not uh, accept the um, Catholic teachings. And they estimate about 10 million were martyred by um, pagan Rome, the Roman Empire. And there are still Christians today that are being martyred over in Kenya and Rwanda and different other uh, places where they're being shot and killed while they're sitting up in churches or, or while they're having services or, or while they're walking to church or and different types of things being bombed and all these things. And these things are happening because of the name Jesus. Um, but we are not suffering such um, afflictions, but our brothers and sisters are. And so we should cherish and thank God for what he has um, uh, allowed us to receive and, and blessed us to be born in a country where uh, such uh, brutality is not tolerated. Can we say amen? You know, we're very, we're very fortunate. Uh, and still, you have folk that won't come to church. You know, but those people are still going to church, even though that they know that they're going to be killed. Some of those people are still going to church, even though that they have been threatened with their lives. You know, and that's a love for God that uh, you have to admire. So we're going to talk about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the darkest day that man will ever know. It is the day that God is pouring out his wrath upon those uh, men and women in the earth that refuse to repent. Now this will happen um, after the rapture of the church. Right now what we're waiting on is the rapture. The next prophecy to be fulfilled is the coming of the Lord. If I can get a little more volume if possible. We are waiting on Jesus to come and he can come at any time. He's due to come at any time. Um, and once he comes and takes the church out of the earth, then the tribulation period will begin with the entrance of the Antichrist claiming to be Israel's Messiah. Now, I'm supposed to be going to one of our churches and teach a three-day Bible class on um, the tribulation period. And I'm supposed to be looking at some dates, and, and I just remember I got to get back, <laughs> get back with them. Um, to, to teach um, the series so that um, they will know what, what, what is to come, what the Bible says. As far as I know, there's only one apostolic preacher on television that is actually dealing with um, end time prophecies. And I can't remember his name, but his last name is Irwin. And the name of his broadcast is uh, End Time Prophecy, I think it is. And, of course, he does a very good job on teaching. It's just that he believes that the church is going through tribulation period. You know, so if you ever watch him, uh, he gives out good information, but he just doesn't, he's just confused as to uh, when the rapture is going to take place. But as far as we know, that's the only one that is on uh, a cable network that is actually teaching on end time prophecy. So uh, that, that is accurate, should I say, that is uh, apostolic. Um, so I think that we need to get it right. I think our people need to know what's going to happen and it needs to be accurate. We don't need to be hearing the church is going through tribulation. Can we say amen? <laughs> the Bible says that we shall be saved from wrath through him. And that wrath is the day of the Lord, which will begin in the middle of the tribulation period and go into the last half of the tribulation period. Now, what we dealt with in Jackson was not the day of the Lord, but it was the events leading up to the day of the Lord, where the um, Lord, the Lamb of God, opens up the first six seals. First six seals has to do with the judgments that God will pronounce after the church is raptured upon the earth, upon mankind. 
And the first six seals covers the first half of the seven year tribulation period, which is called um, the time of Jacob's trouble. It is a period of time where um, it's going to be for seven years. Now, when Jesus came, as I fix my mic here because it's not acting right here. Um, when Jesus came, the Bible says he came to his what? His own and his own what? Received him not. Uh, now, they rejected him as a nation. But you see, when Jesus came, there was only two tribes that was left in Jerusalem. And that was um, Benjamin and, um, Lord have mercy, Judah. <laughs> you know, the reason why I got forgot there, because I always, when I say it, I always say Judah and Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin. That's because when Solomon backslid, God said he was going to judge his, he was going to judge his son for his sins. And part of that judgment, or that judgment simply was that under Solomon's son Rehoboam, God was going to split the kingdom of Israel. And that 10 tribes would leave and go um, north. And two tribes would stay. And that's exactly what happened during the time of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, when he took over. So the 10 tribes went north and intermarried with the Assyrians, and that's where you came with the Samaritans. Two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, stayed in Jerusalem. Now, in the 10 tribes was called Israel. The two tribes were called Judah. And that's why when you read uh, in the books of prophecy of the prophets, you see the expressions when God is speaking to Israel and Judah. And then in one place in the New Testament, it talks about both of the houses of Israel. Now, when the tribes split, the 10 tribes, which was known as Israel, and the two tribes, which were known as Judah. They each had their own kings and God raised up prophets to prophesy uh, to the 10 tribes. They had their prophets that God raised up among them. And then the two tribes that God raised up prophets to prophesy to them. Out of all of the kings that Israel had, the 10 tribes, they were all wicked kings. There was not a good king among them. Of Judah, they had some good kings. They had some good ones and they had some bad ones. But Israel didn't have any good kings. When we talk about Israel now, we're talking about the 10 tribes. So after God sent prophet after prophet and they killed them, refused to hear what they had to say, refused to hear the word of the Lord, God was fed up with Israel and he allowed the Assyrians to come in uh, and take them captive. And when they went into captivity under the Assyrians, they intermingled among them and became known as the Samaritans. Half Assyrian, half Jew. Then, 125 years later, because of Judah's rebellion, God sold them into captivity unto Nebuchadnezzar. The difference between Judah going into captivity and Israel going into captivity, Judah came out and went back to Jerusalem and rebuilt their walls and their city and their temple. And that, those were the tribes that were standing when Jesus came. Israel never came back out of captivity. And those 10 tribes is known today as what they call the lost tribes of Israel. And so when Jesus came to his own and his own received him not, his own he came to were the two tribes that were standing in Jerusalem. But Paul prophesied in the book of uh, Romans and said that all Israel will be saved. 
So God decided that the tribulation period would be a time for him to come back again to save some out of all of Israel, the rest of the 10 tribes. And then you have in the book of Revelation, chapter number seven, I think it is, you have the, uh, well, in chapter 12, you have the 144,000 that are caught up to God. And in Revelation chapter seven, let you know who that 144,000 is. That's 12,000 out of all of the 12 tribes of Israel that will not take the mark of the beast, that will be caught up to God and to his throne uh, in the middle of the tribulation period. So the tribulation period is a time for God to give Israel another chance because when he came before, he only came to how many tribes? Two. But there's 10 other tribes that he's got to give an opportunity to. And that's part of the tribulation period. Now, Israel to this day are being punished by God. They're being whipped because when they went into the promised land, they backslid. And backslid so to where God had to pronounce judgments upon them. And Moses told them before they died that if they go into their promised land, which he already knew that they were going to do, he tells them in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy that God is going to get them. And in the book of Numbers, he tells them that they will be punished seven times more for their sins. And so, in Jesus giving them an opportunity and they rejected him, rejected him as a nation of people, then God um, allowed uh, Titus and his Roman army to come in some 30-something years later and destroy all of Jerusalem and destroy their temple. So now they don't have their temple to worship anymore. You follow? I know this is a lot of information. I hope this is not, as they call it, information overload. But if you get the CD, you will, you will have all the information. Just give you a little history now. So, um, because they went into the promised land and backslid, this affected them when Jesus came for them rejected him. And so God... Um, decided that he would punish them and that their punishment will begin when they went into Babylon under captivity that will continue throughout that time somewhere between, they don't know the approximate date. Some use 605 B.C., some use 586 B.C. Anyway, they went into captivity and when they went into captivity, that began the era of what we know as the times of the Gentiles, which is a period of 2,520 years of which God will be punishing Israel. That's why they went through all that they went through in Babylon. That's why they went through what they went through in uh, Antiochus, uh, Epiphanes. That's why they went through all what they went through with the Roman Empire, Titus and his army. That's why they went through what they went through uh, with uh, Hitler, all these things were prophesied um, that they would go through these things um, because of their rejection of God when they went into the promised land. So they're being punished, and they're being punished right now. And their punishment will end in the middle of the tribulation period. That's when the times of the Gentiles will end, or that's when the Gentiles will cease to rule over Israel. And that's when the last of the four groups that will be saved during the first half of the tribulation period because they will not take the mark of the beast. Some will be beheaded because they won't take the mark. Some will starve to death because if you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. Uh, and some will be, of course, as we said, executed. And they will be caught up during that first three and a half years, four separate groups, and after God gets everybody out of the earth that's going to be saved, the last half of the tribulation period will begin, and the angel will open up the sixth seal, 
and darkness will be over all the face of the earth, or the sun will turn black and the moon into blood, and then he will open up the um, seventh seal, which will begin the great day of God's wrath, known as the day of the Lord. All right? You get all that? Say amen. All right, so let's go to Isaiah chapter 13 and verse number 6 through 11. And of course, we had to share all that with you to bring you up to date as to what we're dealing with. So when you read this, you're reading about the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord in the scriptures is also the millennial reign. And of course, the millennial reign has to do with a thousand years of peace that will be on the earth. Um, for Israel, it will begin in the middle of the tribulation period. For the rest of the world, it will begin uh, when the battle of Armageddon is finished. All right? Um, let's read Isaiah 13, verse number 6. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one to another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. This reason why this destruction is going to be so great is because this is going to be God doing this. It's not because of something was wrong with the earth or the um, earthquakes caused by um, the, 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 the heat of the eruption, all these kinds. God is actually going to be doing these things. And he says he's going to punish the world for their what? Evil. He's going to punish the world for their evil. Uh, this is something that he's going to do. Now, as we look at verse number six, how ye for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from who? The Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, every man's heart shall melt, they shall be afraid, pain and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be what? Amazed. Amazed. The destruction is going to be so great, it's going to be unbelievable. Now, we were talking on my job the other night, and uh, we were talking about school shootings and all that kind of thing. And then we were discussing about the worst mass killing in United States history at a school. And did you know that that happened in 1927 in Michigan, in Bath, Michigan, that was right outside of Lansing, where a man killed 45 people and 39 of them were children. And he was trying to blow up the whole school um, and he only blew up the south wing because 500 pounds of dynamite failed to ignite in the north wing. And the village of Bath carried 300 people. You see, he was, uh, the man was demon possessed. That's what it was. And because he did not get the elected town clerk of, of Bath, uh, of, of the village of Bath, he said in his heart to kill all of the citizens of Bath's children. And because it was just one school that they had there, uh, and he was trying to kill all of, of the children. 
And uh, if you ever read about it, look up on uh, Wikipedia and read about it there. I guess my mic is not doing very good. Uh, read about it there in uh, Wikipedia. It gives you a detailed account of all the things that he did. He killed his wife. Uh, he uh, blew up his farm. He blew up the um, school. And he called the superintendent over to him to his truck because they didn't know he was the one that done that. Ignited the truck and blew himself up and superintendent up uh, in his truck and killed about five people from that. That happened right here in Michigan. This bath school disaster, as they call it. And the people were giving, um, eyewitnesses were giving detailed accounts of it. And uh, when he had blew up his farm and some of the um, neighbors were coming to try to help, and he drove by in the car, he said, boys, you better get down to the school. Because that's where the real happening is going to be going on. And just as he said that, the school blew up. And people were uh, driving to the school, trying to help parents, uh, trying to get there to check on their children. One woman was holding her dead son between her two dead daughters as she sat there on the hill. And they say that one of the neighbors drove by and was trying to help. He went back to get a rope because they said children were flying all through the air. And um, as he was driving back to his farm to get a rope, he saw... Uh, the man Kehoe, Andrew Kehoe, driving by, waving at him, and he had a full grin where he could see all of his teeth on his face as he was driving by. But the point we're making about this is that uh, when you read the eyewitness accounts of what happened, um, they used the word that they were just amazed at all of the destruction that, that went on. Well, that will be nothing. One man killed all of those people. Well, this is the type of evil that God's going to punish in the day of the Lord. And the structure is going to be so great that the people are simply going to be, as the Bible says, amazed. Verse number nine, well, he says, they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy who? Who is he going to destroy? He's going to destroy the sinners out of it because of their sins. He's going to destroy the sinners. God is going to get the sinners. The sinners in this world that are out there sinning, they know God is looking at them. Some of them even deny God. And of course, we had a pastor that was caught molesting children in his church. And of course, he's locked up in jail, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. And I was just on the phone just talking with one of our bishops. I said, how in the world can a man that is an apostolic preacher get so out of control to where he is molesting children? I said, he needs to go to the bottom jail and put it in the bottom hell. And one thing about uh, child molesters, they say, there's no real cure for them. It's just something um, that is within them that uh, is just destructive. And of course, uh, once you damage a child like that, uh, it takes God to recover them. It takes him to do it. But um, it's, just, it's just a shame. Um, this is the type of evil that God is going to come back to punish. Now, we are not going to be here. Can we say amen? You know why we're not going to be here? Because we're going to be where? In the rapture. And all these people that like to get online and talk about that God is not concerned about sin and all these other type of things and have their own opinions about God and blasting people that preach and tell the truth and try to witness to them and all the other kind of stuff, God is going to get them. The Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. Angry every day. Can you imagine being angry every day? The Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. And... Um, 
This is going to be a time of which he's going to punish. He says he's going to, um, in verse number uh, nine, he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. In verse number 11, he says, and I will punish the world for their what? For their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Iniquity is unacceptable worship. Worshiping God in a manner that is unacceptable. There are a lot of people that gather together in the name of the Lord, supposedly, and making God angry. Making him angry. Uh, acting like that they are his children. Calling themselves worshiping him. And all he's doing is getting angry. One scripture I read years ago for the first time when I first got saved, a long time ago, I read, came across this scripture um, in the Old Testament. And the Lord is trying to run away from me right now as I'm about to quote it. But um, it speaks concerning that if a man's ways displease God, even his prayer will be an abomination. Can you imagine that a person can live before God in such a horrid way that God would consider their prayers a sin or an abomination? Abomination is uh, something that God detests to the highest degree. To them to actually, uh, their prayers be an abomination. I'm going to have to find that scripture maybe before the night is out, but I remember reading that years ago for the first time. I said, how in a world can a man have hope of salvation if every time he talks to God, God says it's an abomination? But there are a lot of people that are in that condition. There are a lot of people that spiritually are in that type of place with God to where their prayers our abomination. These are the type of people that he's going to come to punish. All right. Um, now, let us um, read on here. Let's read a little further. Um, well, I think that's enough right there. Now, uh, as we told you before, God never judges the righteous with the wicked. Whenever God pours out his wrath, he does not judge the righteous with the wicked. When um, the 9-11 occurred, those two planes crashed into the Twin Towers. Some preachers got on television saying that God was punishing America for homosexuality. But did you know that there were saints that worked in that World Trade Center that died? That were members of our churches um, in... Um, uh, over there in that part where it happened, was it Washington, New York City? Um, particularly Bishop Bonner had saints that worked in that tower. That was not God punishing America for their sins. When the Hurricane Katrina happened and some of the TV preachers got on television and said that God was punishing, uh, was that New Orleans? because the gay parade was supposed to happen and uh, God was punishing. That was not God doing that. That's just one of the signs of the end times, conditions of our time. But when this happens, the day of the Lord, this will be God doing this. And he will not be punishing the righteous, he will be punishing the sinners or the world for their evil. Now, that's why it's important for us to make the rapture so that we won't have to be bothered with any of this. We will be up in heaven looking down and seeing the wrath of God being poured out. Can we say amen? All right. So God never judges the righteous with the wicked. Let's show you that. Um, well, we won't. You can read in your spare time. We'll save a little time. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17 through 33 was the uh, incident of God talking to Abraham and God saying to Abraham shall I well God saying shall I hide from Abraham the thing that which I was to do 
I am to do, seeing that he shall be a great man. Well, the Lord was there to let Abraham know that next year Sarah is going to have a child. He showed up there to talk to Abraham in angelic form. Of course, Abraham thought he was just a man. He appeared there with two angels and told Abraham that next year, according to the time of life, Sarah's going to have a child. And then he uh, said, shall I hide from Abraham that which I'm going to do? And he sends forth the two angels to Sodom and Gomorrah, and then he tells Abraham what he is going to do, how he is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, Abraham knew he had a nephew over there, Lot, and his family. And he um, says, be it far from thee to destroy the righteous from the wicked. Well, let's look. I guess we do need to look at it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17. You won't read the whole thing. We'll just read a part of it. Genesis chapter 18, not 17, 18. And in your spare time, read that account, verse 17 through 33. All right. So God sends the angels to Sodom to destroy it. Now Abraham realizes that Lot, his nephew, is there. And let's see what he says. Let's pick it up in verse number 22. Let's read there. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be uh, 50 righteous within the city. Peradventure means if so be, or in the event there be 50 righteous within the city, wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? Why is he saying that? Because he says, be it far from thee to destroy the righteous with who? The wicked. In other words, are you going to punish, allow the wicked, or allow the righteous to suffer the same penalty of the wicked even though that they are righteous and haven't done any of those things. That's why I've never been a fan of punishing everybody for what one person did. You know, like in school. <laughs> the teacher likes to punish the whole class for one person's uh, mischievous act. Isn't this what Abraham is? And of course, Abraham is on a larger scale because he's talking about destroying. But look at the principle. Can we say amen? I mean, we can learn a lot from God and the way that he does things. You know? Now, if the class, if someone did something in the class and you don't know who did it and you say who did it and they don't want to say, so then, then you have to, they have to suffer suffer the consequences because they refuse to tell who's guilty. Well, that means you're trying to turn people into being a snitchy. Snitch. Well, the old saying, tell the truth and shame the devil. <laughs> you know. Well, um, but anyway, just a side note there. So this is what Abraham is saying. Are you going to destroy if that what? Uh, per adventure, or in the event that there are 50 righteous, are you going to destroy the whole city and the righteous too? All right, let's read on. Verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this man. In other words, don't, don't do that. That don't seem to be right. Be far from thee to do after this manner. To slay the righteous with what? The wicked. And that the righteous should be what? As the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth what? Do right? 
Good question, isn't it? Verse 26. And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for what? For their sakes. For whose sakes? For the 50 righteous. Did you know that there are some people that are spared in this world because of us? The church? That there are some people in our families that are spared because of us? That's why when I get on a plane, I ain't worried about the plane going down. The plane can't go down because I'm on the plane. As far as I'm concerned, <laughs> some people are afraid of flying. Well, get on with me. It ain't going to go down. <laughs> you say amen? Now, some of y'all might say, well, that's kind of, I, I believe that. I believe that. I'm called of God. I'm saved. You know, can't nothing just uh, uh, happen to me. Now, if, if it happened to some other person, that, that's them. I'm talking about me. Can we say amen? You know, I believe I can walk through certain parts of Saginaw, the worst of Saginaw, and nothing happened. I believe that. Some folk might say they can't, but I believe I can. Because, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because the Saginaw police. No, because they ain't going to show up. They're going to wait till, is it all clear? All right, they're going to show up. I've seen them do it. You know? No, I believe that. Now, I'm not talking about I'm going to show God, I'm going to show y'all that and then go walk all the way down. That's tempting God there. Can we say amen? The Bible says, Thou shalt what? Thou shalt not tempt who? The Lord I got. Now, now, don't tempt God. But if you just happen to be over there, Don't fear no evil because he is with you. Is that right? Are y'all hear what I'm saying? I believe that. Oh, yeah. Well, um, God said I won't destroy it for 50. And then he gets all the way down to 10. Let's pick it up uh, at verse number 32. Let's read there. And he said, this is Abraham, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure or in the event, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten sake. And we find out that there was not even ten. That actually only three made it out because his wife looked back it became a pillar of salt. And I was talking to one um, preacher, outstanding Bible teacher, that salt was used to destroy back in those days. And that when God turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt, and Jesus tells us thousands of years later, uh, 4,000 years later, remember Lot's wife, or should I say 2,000 years later, remember Lot's wife. That's because the angel told her by the word of the Lord that when you escape, don't look back. And what did she do? She looked back, because even though she was out of Sodom, Sodom wasn't out of her. And God turned her into a pillar of salt. What was God saying? God, that was God's statement as to how much he hates disobedience. Turned her to a pillar of salt and she is still there to this day. Turned her to a pillar of salt, not even allowing her to be buried, not even allowing her to have a funeral, not even allowing her to have a grave. God froze her and turned her into salt right where she stood. That's just how much he hates disobedience. You know why? Because you know who the first person that was disobedient was? Well, Adam. Before that, the devil or Lucifer. That was a demonstration of God telling us how much he hates disobedience and turned her into salt right where she stood in her disobedience as a memorial to all of man that will come afterwards 
what disobedience would do for you. And God burned Sodom and Gomorrah and turned it into ashes and filled it up with water. And that's the Dead Sea to this day. And to this day, Sodom and Gomorrah is the Dead Sea. And God hated so much what they did and that he judged them so that he destroyed that land to where nothing could ever grow there to this day. And these guys want to talk about being gay for God. Uh, look what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. He hated what they were doing so much that God destroyed them and the land and destroyed it so that nothing can grow there ever. And to this day, the Dead Sea, there is nothing that's in it but just ash, just nothing. Can't even anything grow in there. Can't, you know, nothing is there. <laughs> you know, it just goes to show you just how deceived people are today. I think that they can be gay and try to make us accept it. I saw on the Huffington Post the caption of the picture, it says, this is disturbing. And it was a t-shirt. And on the t-shirt was some words. Gay is not okay. And they had on the caption, disturbing, horrific. <laughs> that gay is not okay. Let me get a t-shirt. Can we say amen? I'll put some things on there you really think are horrible. <laughs> but they thought that that was just so shocking that somebody would have a t-shirt Then it said controversy. Gay is not okay. Isn't that something? That's why God is going to come down and burn these sinners and these punish these evil people in this world. Now, no saint has no business missing the rapture and being here for that because it's going to happen. The Bible prophesying of it and we're looking at it uh, tonight. Can we say amen? All right, the microphone keeps slipping, so hope the volume is, is okay. All right, so there wasn't 10 righteous there uh, and that's why God destroyed it and it's destroyed even to this day. Now, the church will not going through the tribulation period. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26 and verse 20 and 21. This is a prophecy of the church being caught up and being protected from the indignation, the wrath of God. Verse 20 and 21. All right. If we have it, let's read Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20 to 21. All right, let's read. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the what? Indignation be what? Overpassed. This is the prophecy of the rapture that Isaiah has seen. Thousands of years before it even happens. It hasn't even happened yet. We're in 2014, but he saw it. Now, why is he telling us to come into the chambers? Verse 21. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover slain. Now keep in mind, God is going to do this. Now there's going to be four major earthquakes during this time. And the earthquake, the Bible says, is going to shake the foundation of the earth. The globe, the earth globe is actually going to shake. And you know who's going to shake it? God's going to shake it. He says, I'm not going to shake heaven, 
I'm going to shake the earth. I'm telling you, it's going to be a time like there has never been. The actual globe of the earth is actually going to shake. God's going to shake it himself. And there won't be anybody to stop it. Because at that time, there will be nobody in the earth or nobody else that will be saved. Now, there will be Israelites that will be protected in the earth. And we'll get to that as we go along. But as far as the rest of the world, they will be fair game for God to punish them. And so that's why he's telling us, come my people, because he's going to have a place protected for us. Not only us, but the four groups that will be caught up during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. You have the two witnesses that will be preaching. You have the 144,000. You have those that will be beheaded. And then you have those that uh, the scripture calls or uh, that, that will have palms that we call palm bearers. And of course, they will be caught up and the rest of Israel that will not take the mark of the beast, that will not be caught up, God is going to protect them someplace in the earth from the wrath that is to come and he's going to shake this earth the destruction from the Almighty. But as far as the church is concerned, us, we will not be here when that happens. Uh, let's look at another scripture. Let's go to Psalms 37. Psalms 37 and verse number 13. Well, I'm going to read verse 12. Verse 12 and 13. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. Verse 13. The Lord shall laugh at him for he seeth that his day is what? Coming. The wicked have a day coming. They have their day and it's coming. Let's jump over to verse 17 through 20. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. That's us. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. Shall they what? Consume away. That's the great day of his wrath. Uh, verse number 25. Uh, let me see. Where are we at? We're in uh, uh, Psalm 37. Yeah, let's look at verse 25 through 29. I have been young. And now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor has seen what? We will not be forsaken. He will not leave us here uh, with, with all these things going on, because be it far from him the judge the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous be as the wicked. All right, um, verse 26. He is ever merciful, and lender than his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good. And dwell, what? Forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his, what? What does he doesn't do? He doesn't, what? Forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved. Now, the wicked in tribulation period are going to be destroyed. But the righteous shall be, what? Preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked, what? Shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein, how long? Forever. And so he is not going to allow us to suffer the wrath of God. And then there's a scripture in the book of Thessalonians that says that we shall be saved from wrath through him. And let me see if I can find that scripture right quick. 
uh, so that we can read it. Um, First Thessalonians chapter one, verse number 10. Let's read that scripture. And we're going to be coming to a close in a few minutes. First Thessalonians chapter number one. And verse number 10. And of course, there's a ton of other scriptures um, that we're going to look at or that, that we could. Um, what did I say? First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Did I say verse 10? Well, I don't think that's the right one. Um, well, let us go to... Um, Second Thessalonians chapter two. I'll show you the church will not be going through any of the wrath of God. Now, of course, it talks about the Antichrist in the first few verses. We might as well read it. This will probably be our last scripture um, for tonight. And uh, then we'll get into the real meat of the subject on, um, well, on Friday we have Foot wash communion, is that right? So we'll get into the real meat of it, Lord willing, on Tuesday. Verse number one. Now we beseech you, brethren, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number one. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, he's talking about the rapture there, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit no by word, no by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is what? At hand. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a what? Now we are in that right now, falling away, where people are falling away from God. The backsliding. You're hearing about preachers doing all kinds of evil stuff, getting caught locked up in prison. You know, like we told you earlier, a lot of evil things that are going on in our world. A lot of people falling away out of the church. Those that have been in reputation for salvation and honor for so many years, finding out that they've been involved in all kinds of evil. Or people that have been saved for decades, backsliding, going back out into the world. We're in the great falling away. Every church is losing somebody. Everybody's losing somebody. They even say that Jake's and his church had to lay off some employees because he's losing people. <laughs> I was watching the program today. I can't remember what the program was. Oh, it was a, one old black and white movie. And the man was riding around uh, in the car with his priest. And the priest was say, said these words that I thought was pretty peculiar. He says... I don't preach. I'm a preacher, but I don't preach. That's why my church is so large. <laughs> I thought that was pretty peculiar, but, 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 that, but that's the truth, isn't it? You know, that, that is the truth, even back in that day. But we're in the great falling away where many people are leaving the church, falling away. And even some that are in the church that are falling away in the church Active, but in their heart they are falling away. That's the day that we're living in. Before the rapture takes place, that's going to happen. Well, it's happening right now. So the rapture can take place now. Can we say amen? All right. Well, let's read on. Um, um, verse number, well, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed. What? Son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. That will be the devil in human flesh. The devil will take possession of a man and he will rise up in the ranks and become the leader of the nation of Israel. So the president is not the Antichrist. The pope is not the Antichrist. Antichrist would be the leader of Israel. And guess who will be his biggest ally? 
the, the West, which is the United States or the ununited States of America. Because they're far from united. Can you say amen? Far from united. But anyway, um, that man of sin. Now, some people teach that the Antichrist is a world system that is not a human being, but that it is a system. And that the Antichrist system is set up in the world right now, hence some people teach that we are already in the tribulation period. Last time I drank some of my water, it was nice and cold and fresh. It was not blood. Can you say amen? And of course, I got downstairs in my library a complete teaching that the book of Revelation is something of the past that has already happened. So you see, I stay ready for anything anybody come up with. You know, there's a bunch of foolishness. They've got dates and everything as to when this happened and when that happened, all this kind of foolishness. It's ridiculous. But some people teach that the Antichrist is a system. Well, the Bible says, the man of sin be revealed, the son of what? Perdition. The Antichrist is going to be a human being that's already alive. We don't know who he is. He might not even know that he's going to be the Antichrist because we're so close to the end that there's no time for somebody to be born and to grow up and to be raised up. So he's already alive. We don't know who it's going to be. But we do know that he will come in and Israel will accept him as their long-awaited Messiah. They will think that he is their Jesus because he will come and proclaim himself to be so. But he will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the devil in human flesh. In the book of Daniel, it says that he will be the vilest man that ever lived because he will be the devil as a human being. All right. Well, the man of sin, the son of perdition. What does he do? Verse number four who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is what? Called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, Israel don't have their temple. So if the scripture is true that he's going to sit in the temple and call himself God, that must mean then that their temple worship is going to be restored. Over there where the Muslim Mosque of Omar sets, which is considered the Holy Mount over there, the, um, which is sacred to Muslims and Jews alike. You see, the Antichrist is going to come in and he's going to achieve things in the Middle East that have never been achieved before. And he's going to get Israel their land back, their site back where their temple was, and restore their temple worship. And that's why they're going to think that he's their God because he's going to accomplish things that man has never been able to accomplish since they lost their land. And fighting over their land right now, that's what the Middle East is all about. It's just about real estate. Because Israel is saying that's our property because God gave it to our father Abraham and the Palestinians and, and, and all of the other all fighting over the Gaza Strip over there. That's what that fight is all about over there. And that's why they hate us so much, some of those uh, Arab nations, because we're allied with Israel. But he's going to get them their land back and restore their worship. And they're going to think that he's God. And in the middle of the tribulation period, all this is going to happen during the first three and a half years. Then in the middle of the tribulation period, he's going to turn on all of them sit in that temple, cause the sacrifice to cease, call himself God, and say that those saints that were raptured up, those people that were raptured up were a bunch of phonies. That's what the Bible says. And that he's going to demand the whole world bow down and take his mark. And that's when the great day of God's wrath will begin at that time. Because everybody up to that point that's going to be saved will be taken out of the earth and that's when this will happen. He who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God 
or that is worshiped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse number five, we're almost finished. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Verse six, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Something is holding the Antichrist back from coming forth and being revealed and taken over. You know who it is? It's the church. It's us. As long as the church is in the earth, the Antichrist, the devil, cannot take over. God is holding him back through the church. Well, let's read it, and then we'll be done for the night. Verse number uh, 6, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The mystery of iniquity is the working of the devil. All right? The mystery of iniquity is already working. The spirit of the Antichrist is already in the earth. Let's read. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now the word let means to hinder in this verse. I have 647 words downstairs in my office of archaic words that are in the Bible. They are words that are no longer in common usage. They don't mean the same thing today. One of those words is let. And the word let today means to allow and permit. But the word let back in 1611, when the Bible was translated out of the original languages, the word let mean, meant to hinder impede, stop, prevent. So when you read the text here, verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now hindereth or prevents will prevent until he be taken out of the way. The he is the church. So the church is hindering the Antichrist from coming forth, taking control, and will continue to hinder until he, the church, is taken out of the way. How are we hindering the devil's work? By preaching the gospel. By living holy. By people looking at our lives or people listening to us witness to them and coming and getting saved. We're hindering the work of the devil. That's why he can't come forth. But when the time comes for the church to be taken out of the earth, there will be nothing left here to stop the devil and he will go forth until God comes and not only stops him, but put an end to man's government. Now, if the church is going through the tribulation period, what does this scripture mean? Can we say amen? <laughs> if this scripture means that the church is keeping the devil back, then how can the church be going through the tribulation period? You see how misguided people can be? We, the church, is the hope of the world. Can we say amen? You know, the church is the hope of the world. Without the church, the world is doomed. Well, the church is going to be taken out of the earth and the world is going to be doomed. So when somebody tells you that the church is going through the tribulation period, just look at them and go, ha, 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 ha. You might be here, but I'm not going to be here. I'm going back with Jesus in the rapture because God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. Shall not the judge of all the earth, what? You forgot already? Do right? Isn't it what Abraham asked him? He would say amen. All right, we're going to close. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. James 3, verse number 2. James 3 and 2, all right? Uh, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So what's your question? Well, when he says here, verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. Sometimes 
you can be in a position, no matter what you do, people are going to be offended. If you are in a position of authority, you get many times double the reward. And also you get double judgment. Now, in many things we offend all. Sometimes everybody may be offended of us. All right? If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Now, you can be in a position, get yourself in a position in God to where you do not offend people by what you say because you are not saying the wrong thing. You can, in that sense, you are perfect or complete in not saying the wrong thing to offend people. But you're going to offend somebody if you tell the truth. He's not necessarily talking about that. But we can control our tongue to such a degree that nobody will be able to condemn us for saying the wrong thing because we're always saying the right thing. And if you have mastered your tongue, for in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, Whatsoever the governor listed or wishes, even so the tongue is a little member. This is what he's talking about, offending people with what you say, your tongue. Little member and boast of great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So God has to tame your tongue. You have to look to God to tame your tongue. And if you look to God to tame your tongue, that you do not offend anybody by saying things that you should not say. If you can control your words, you can control your whole body. And if you do that, you are perfect or complete in that area. Does that answer the question? Yes. Sure. Acts 7, verse 55 and 56. Okay. Uh, Acts, oh, I'm in chapter 3. Acts 7, verse 55 and 56. Um, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. All right, what's your question? He saw Jesus. That's exactly what he saw. He saw Jesus. He saw him in the place of power, the place of favor, and the place of spirit. He saw him um, in all of his power and glory and authority. Right. Right. When he said the right hand of God, he saw Jesus in his glory, in his power, right on the throne. He saw God in his glory as Jesus Christ. All right? Anybody else? Yes, Brother Blaine. Perdition means final destruction, final ruin. The son of perdition. He's the son of the final destruction. All right? He's going to be destroyed ultimately. Yes.
Yes, that's Thessalonians. Romans 5 and 9. Thank you very much. I was way off. Romans 5 and 9. I know I got it marked in there. I don't know why I was thinking of Thessalonians. Um, yes, there it is. Romans 5 and 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Thank you very much. Bless you. Yes. Yes, where's that at? Prayers abomination. Let me see. Proverbs 15 and 8. That sounds that might be it. Um, let me see here. 15 and 8. All right, that's that is one of them, but that's not the one I was thinking of. What's the other one you have? This this says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. No, that's not the one. What was the other one you had? Proverbs 28 and 9. Um, let me see here. He that turneth away his ear, that's it, from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. That is the one. Proverbs 28 and 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing.